Welcome back to Memory Lane, where I would say once a month, but I'll say we average about once a month. But this is the point in time where I repurpose one of my old episodes from the catalog of South Sharav Radio. Repurpose it, let you guys hear it, whether it's a few minutes of a clip, whether it's a whole episode of either the Av, the Stoop, my story, what have you. When you're on all these social media apps, you always get anniversary timelines, reminders, birthdays, and I've been getting a few in the last like week or so, which is making me think which ones to do. And you know, recently I, there was about three episodes I actually wanted to repurpose. Um, I may repurpose these ones later in you know the year or the next twelve months or what have you. But so there was one episode that popped up on my timeline, or two actually that popped up on my timeline. Both of them uh, were the same guest that we had on um, because we recorded them about the same time, you know, taking you behind the curtain a little bit. Uh, but five years ago, around this time, this week, this is when I was doing one of my last series, uh, Seasons of the Stoop, um, which was a mini podcast series. And I had the 50th anniversary of Tommy Smith and John Carlos, the 1968 Olympic medal photo, uh, you know, the two track athletes with the black fist in the air. Uh, we went over their whole story. Uh, the guest I had on that time was uh, my South Sharaf family member, Headley. Um, rest in peace to him. And we had at the time he was working for ESPN 30 for 30 podcast. Now he's working for NPR. Uh, Mr. Andrew Mambo, shout outs to him. We did a 50th anniversary about that time. There was also 50th anniversary on one of my favorite episodes, um, a classic episode, also a Stoop series, uh, the classic episode of Club Dream. There's a mystical, magical place. <laughs> <laughs> I know some friends I've told this story many times too. they've heard us over the years. Um, but if at that time you went to DC in the early 2000s, this is one of the greatest, uh, one of the best clubs that for our generation that we went to for sure. It was one of the best clubs in the East coast. You can go into the catalog and find that one. It was called, um, it was all a dream, but I had the, um, I had club and brackets in front of the dream. So it was all a club dream. If you want to check that out and have some jokes and laughs about our experiences during that time, you know, in the in the D.C. area, the DMV area, that was one of the biggest clubs. That club held about anywhere from five to ten thousand people. It was just madness. The memory land episode we're about to do isn't about that either. It's within the same season, though. I think it was season three. It might have been. I think it was season three of the stoop. Um, but the episode that I want to feature today was. Um, I listened back to it the other day and I thought it was interesting to play it back because, um, you know, recently with Aaron Rodgers getting injured, now I'm going into the football topic, Aaron Rodgers getting injured, uh, Colin Kaepernick had put a letter out to the New York Jets to basically solicit his services of being a backup quarterback, even a, even to play on the practice squad. And it made me think about, you know, because there was a lot of conversations about you know, why was he taking this stance? And, you know, like he, he basically let everything that he was pushing and promoting and the, the foundation that he was standing on be reduced to rubble because he was trying to get back into the NFL again. And it made me think of this episode that um, that we put out about five years ago uh, was featured by my South Sharaf family member, uh, Kevin W. It was also featured by author Jonathan Boxel as well. Those were my two guests on the show at that time. And we had an episode about Colin Kaepernick, but it was about it was around the time when he had just signed a major deal with Nike, and at the time, this is about five years ago too. Um, I think it was like September of 2018. It was a crazy time because if you remember back about this, this is about the time when you know he was out the league. the The whole thing about Colin Kaepernick and Black Lives Matter was at a feverish pitch, and during that period, um, you know, Nike decided to support him as a corporation, and they gave him a you know, like an eight figure deal. It was a huge deal at the time, you know, coming out with his own apparel. They were going to support the movement. And we had a lot of thoughts about it. Similar sides, very opposing sides at times. It was actually a really good episode to listen to. So I wanted to replay that one. You know, you guys can share your comments on it with me directly or um, wherever you listen to podcasts as well. But this is an episode I want to play back because that conversation to, to, to listen back to it now and think about what's happening now five years later with regards to everything that happened with that move or with the movement to update like what's what's been going on with uh, Kaepernick. And I know I'm not saying Kaepernick isn't still doing big things in the community and still pretty much being quiet. But 
you know, I, I feel like the energy of it, it's kind of died down publicly. I don't know, you know, if it's morphing into something bigger behind the scenes. I mean, God willing, I hope it is. But it's just interesting to listen to this conversation now you know, that we have five years ago and, and seeing our, what our thoughts were at that point and listening back to, and listening back to it today and seeing where we are now with it. And, you know, I just want to get your thoughts, but I thought it was interesting just, just to kind of reflect back on this one. All right. So wherever you listen to podcasts, we are there. We are there. Um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, tune in Alexa, wherever you listen to podcasts, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button, hit the favorite button wherever you can. Wherever you see those five stars, I want all of it. Give it to me. All right. And also, um, to check in with the catalog, um, you know, I give you a couple of examples to go back into, but uh, but make sure you check SouthShoreAve.com. Once again, that is SouthShoreAve.com for the catalog. All right. This is Memory Lane on South Shore Ave Radio. And this episode originally was called <laughs> the Colin Kaepernick edition. Very original title. Please, all the hand claps, please, please. Don't hold the applause. Don't hold the applause for that name. Like I said, again, uh, if you want to go back into the catalog and listen to everything. But yeah, but that was the original name of the episode if you want to go back into the catalog. All right, now here we go. Uh, so back in 1988, Nike started their Just Do It marketing campaign that swept the nation. Uh, between the marketing push b behind the commercials, the merchandise that was launched from this the sports icons that were entering their primes as athletes at the same time, which includes athletes like Michael Jordan and his Air Jordans that was engulfing the culture at the time. It helped Nike make a quantum leap in front of its other competitors. And to be honest, it never looked back since. Uh, this month, they're celebrating the 30th anniversary of the iconic marketing slogan by making Colin Kaepernick the face of its marketing campaign. Now, for those who don't know the story, Kaepernick in 2016 decided to kneel for the flag to raise awareness of police brutality against unarmed black and brown people, among other things. Uh, since he opted out of his contract in March of 2017 with the San Francisco 49ers, predictably, no football team has touched Kaepernick for his quarterbacking services, uh, which also includes his former teammate, Eric Reed, who happens to still be a free agent, even though he's only 26 years old and is among the upper echelon of uh, players at his position. Nike will not only continue to endorse Kaepernick, uh, but they'll provide him with his own line of shoes and clothing apparel. Now, many people are in full support of this, and while there is a certain sector that are burning the Nike gear in retaliation towards Nike's latest move, I have both of you guys on this uh, podcast today to get your thoughts on the matter. Uh, Kevin, I'll start with you because you seem the most riled up when I spoke to you lately. Um, <laughs> what, what is your initial thoughts uh, when you when you saw that this deal happen? So my thoughts my thoughts are this: I think it's a brilliant marketing campaign on on Nike's side because it's created enough buzz and controversy on both sides of the spectrum. It's gener they've gone viral with their campaign. Um, there's been some memes already created as a result of it. It's stirred the pot on, on, on a few sides. Millennials are going to sop it up like nobody's business. But my fear is what is already happening after I saw the first commercial, which went viral. And that's that the message that he originally stood for has been diluted. It's a washout now. Granted, they, they can make Nike hijab wear for Middle Eastern girls and amputees and, and such can, can excel in sports, but that's not why Colin Kaepernick was removed from the league, and that's not what he stood for. What are your thoughts, John? I, I agree completely. Like, it's a commodity now. It's a, it's a slogan. It's a campaign that everybody can get behind, but yet you can forget about what the real issue is. And, um, yeah, and, and that's the problem. I, I kind of see it a little bit more sinister I know that we're in a system that is has structural racism in it and be and, and, and to maintain that system that power structure there are certain tactics they use and one of the tactics is if you can't beat them join them mm. and that's a brilliant tactic because you know I'm um, in therapy 
So I was a therapist, and that's a tactic I use all the time. Anytime you have objections, you know, with, with clients or there's resistance, we, we join them. We join their pain and their struggle in order to disarm them. And that's a sales technique, too, in sales. You know, if you, if you try to object or you, you, you know, you're not interested in the product, they will join you on that. They'll try to find an agreement and align with you in order to disarm you. So I'm weary of that. At the same time, it's because it has layers to it, man. His ability to uh, make money to come back after what could have been a huge, devastating loss for him in terms, like financially, right, could be showing these youth that you know what you can stand up, you can fight for something, and yeah, you may go through a rough patch, but in the end, you might be able to come through. So it's a, it's kind of a double edged sword, and that's and that's where it's sitting with me. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, I I do see the sinister. If you can't be, if you can't beat them, you join them to dilute the message. I'm like seventy five twenty five on it. Um, you know, I'll start off by saying I, I don't like what Colin Kaepernick has done. I love it. I love it wholeheartedly in terms of his stance and. Um, you know, the, the fact that he's brought everything to the forefront starting from two years ago. How, and how can you hate on somebody who's still strong in his belief, you know, which in turn brought awareness to the subject that affected him dearly? Um, you know, and I, I know myself and friends of the podcast, mm-hmm. Headley and as well as Kevin here, we had a podcast just when I was starting out about two years ago. Uh, when this whole thing essentially was starting with, with all the unarmed black people that was getting shot in 2016, it was like, it was weighing on us, you know, at the time, if you remember, Kevin, like it was, that was a heavy topic for me, especially because like you just, it, it almost seemed like on a weekly basis, somebody else was getting shot. And a few months later, police officers were getting off. That whole time span kind of spearheaded this whole thing. And I mean, this guy did this, you know, at the risk of his career, which so far has been sacrificed. Um, but on top of that, he conti- he continued to deliver on his promise by pumping his own money into the community, even after knowing that he may never work in the NFL again and may never get that kind of money again. And he's pumping a million dollars into different, different organizations within the community and also getting others to follow his lead. Now, as a sports fan, we watched what happened with Muhammad Ali you know, when, when he was trying to stand up against going to war and, you know, he almost went broke during that period when he was without boxing. John Carlos and Tommy Smith went through it after they came back for the Olympics. They had a hard time even getting any kind of employment, much less anything to do with their field. We saw it happen with Craig Hodges. We saw it happen with Mah- Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Uh, you watch those guys lose their livelihood fighting for what they believe in. Some of them bounced back and became icons like Muhammad Ali and and uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith, and then other guys like like a Craig Hodges or or in some cases Raouf, you just never heard from them again. You know they got blocked from ever entering their sport again. Raouf basically had to play in Turkey in order to continue even playing basketball, even though like when he got blocked, he was entering the prime of his career. So to watch an, or a corporate a corporation come in and support Cap in this situation with finances and a platform. I think personally it's amazing, but I'm kind of with you guys as well. Like I, it, it does feel funny to watch a company about to cash in on a movement about police brutality against black and brown people. You know what I mean? Um, is that what they're standing behind? You see, the interesting thing about this Nike campaign is it's not Colin Kaepernick's campaign. They just hired a figurehead. Who's controlling the narrative as to what the campaign is? It's a just do a campaign, but realistically speaking, and did Nike ever issue a stance in regards to the issues of pr- of what was perceived to be what is perceived to be police brutality and unjust treatment of minorities by law enforcement? Not yet. No, it's <laughs> no, it's just it's. I get what you're saying. It's just about taking a stand. So it could be a stand on anything. It's just taking a stand. Okay. Sacrifice your they, point. Are, I, I, I understand what you're saying, Jonathan, but are they taking a stand or are they just hiring a figurehead to boost their campaign? Are they oh, trying to serve a, they're, No, no they're hiring a figurehead. I don't think they're taking any stand. Okay. That's, That's what, what I'm saying. 
I said, listen. That's, that, that's basically it. Now, the other thing is this, Calvin. I appreciate your 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 uh, mentioning Muhammad Ali and Chris Jackson, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf in '94. I, I think it was '94, '95, '96, '97. I think I, I thought it was the season after when uh, Denver changed their uniforms. After, yeah, no, it was a month, I thought it was yeah, then that, was... That, that he took the knee. But Chris Jackson was asked and he spoke about it. Muhammad Ali repeat spoke for years. And you're right. When his career, like uh, when he was banned from boxing, he actually had to do the lecture circuit. And he lectured in uh, in Montreal at Sir George Williams. And my mom went to go watch him speak, actually. Wow. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware about that. But is it just me or has Colin Kaepernick been pretty quiet for the past two years? No, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think he's been. I think, you know what the thing is, though? I think he's quiet, but I think it's 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 a calculated move in that sense. And the reason why I say that is because, again, watching history, <laughs> he's used his silence as a weapon, you know. And, and the reason why I say that is because I think at this stage, anything he says right now is going to get twisted and turned by the media right like they're looking for any kind of any interview that he does anything that he says that's even slightly off kilter from what they're expecting him to say is going to get blown up in the media which is further taken away from anything that he does so with him because I, I, I follow him on like instagram and stuff and he's a definite believer in making his actions speak louder much louder than his words so the things that he, he agreed upon doing, which is, which is, you know, um, pumping money to the community, as I was saying before, he's done it. You know, he's, he's posts, he's made posts about which cut, which, which organization is going to, you know, he's, he's put together a, a campaign called know your rights campaign, which basically, which basically educates young people about knowing their rights as citizens. So he's been doing, he's been doing the work. He just hasn't been talking about it. But he's been doing the work. And I mean, you look at social media, look at all of all of his millions of followers from Instagram and Twitter and everything else. He's letting his actions speak. And I, I think in this sense, I think if if he's being boisterous and using his voice and, and explaining himself over and over and doing the 60 minutes interview or the Oprah Winfrey interview, I think that's where his words can get chopped up by especially by the people that are trying to stop him. You know what I mean? So I think him using his I, I put it put it this way. I don't think it's a coincidence that he hasn't said anything. Do you think that that's the right? Do I think do you that, believe that that? Sorry, do you ahead. believe that that's the right course of action for him not to speak for fear that his words may be misconstrued? I'm sorry, but you have to speak up and clarify some things that people are either going to have the liberty of if if you say nothing, people will take the liberty of, of skewing your message and warping it. And you're not retaliating, so they'll keep punching. Rocky IV, Ivan Drago's not going to stop. You know what I mean? What would you have liked him to to say, or what do you think he should have said more? How many people out there are taking shots at him and are twisting his message? How many people out there still think that it's about disrespecting the troops? Right. How, how many people are there thinking that it's disrespecting the United States and disrespecting the military? Why not continue to reiterate your message of what your what your focus is, what your purpose is? Because I guarantee you that there's somebody out there that thinks they were told he's disrespecting the military, he's anti-America, and they're just going with it. And they've never heard Colin Kaepernick speak. I'll tell you something. The last time I've heard Colin Kaepernick, I, could, I can't remember the last time I heard Colin Kaepernick speak. Until that that Nike uh, na- the, the the monologue that he had for for the commercial this week or last week, right? So you tell me if I'm the only one that like what what's Colin Kaepernick standing for or who is Colin Kaepernick? You know history is written by the winners. Yeah, but I don't think the game is uh, I don't think the game has ended yet. I, I I don't think like like I said I think it's I think he's using his silence as a weapon, but I think eventually he will have to speak. And he probably will say something, but it's it's all planned out. I don't think this is again. I don't think this is just a coincidence that he's not saying anything. I haven't really given that part much thought, to be honest with you. Why he hasn't spoke, you know, it's something mm-hmm. that I have to think more about. But one thing I will say is, I was watching a show the other day. They were just interviewing, um, and you know, I know it's a, it's, it's kind of like a, a far right base, and they're asking him about the whole you know situation with Nike and. Uh, 
And everyone was saying that it was just about the flag and not standing in our troops. So they're always spinning it in that direction. And it, it made me wonder how much really can you say when I believe that there's a segment of the population that just wants to believe what they want to believe. Right. That it's it's just about how dare you, black man. We're paying you. You do what you're told. It's more about having that control lever on us. You know, I think about that that um, scene in Django when he's on that couch and he's watching the fighters fight and he's smoking that cigar. I don't know if you guys saw that. Right, I've seen scene. it once. I just I can't remember the part though. But go on. That was such a that was such a poignant scene because he was obviously making an analogy to to football and boxing and you know all the sports where um, African Americans basically break up their bodies or kill themselves for sports. So to me, it was such a poignant scene because he's sitting there on the couch smoking his, his cigar, and and the two black brothers are killing themselves reminiscent of like Monday Night Football. Mm -hmm. So there's this attitude of you're a workhorse, you're doing what we say, we own you, how dare you speak up and we don't care what you're speaking up about. We're even denying that exists because, you know, we don't really believe what you're saying. We just believe that you guys are commit committing all the crimes anyway, so the police are justified. Mm -hmm. And it's more about you just staying in your place. So to me, that is part of the argument that maybe he does need to talk a little bit more about. But I, I still feel that there's a segment of the population that is just not even going to hear that. Right. And doesn't really care about, is not even willing to see that side. They're always spinning it as it's about the truth. It's about the flag and just denying the fact that the police brutality is even happening. But but I mean the whole thing the whole thing with him kneeling down, um, kneeling for the flag. I mean I mean he explained it <laughs> quite elegantly, like about a couple of years back when he stated that the reason why he he knelt was he came to a compromise. He he spoke with a uh, with somebody from the armed forces, a marine. I, I, his name escapes me right now, but um, but they came to the agreement that you know if you kneel for the flag, you're still honoring the troops while you're still getting your point across and you're not disrespecting the flag. It's part of the penal code. If you look at the flag penal code, kneeling for the flag is not a violation of that. So, I mean, he explained it. You know what I mean? So, well, Ameri Americans can burn the flag too, can't they? Uh, that I'm not sure. I don't think so. But I, but, but I know kneeling is not something, it's not in violation of anything. You know? Um, so, I mean, that, that's, for, that's, that's the start. That's for one. And I mean, he's explained it. It's funny because even on my um, mm. my Facebook timeline, I think I had reposted the conversation that the Marine had in, um, I believe it was um, it's this article for Sports Illustrated, but I, I reposted it on my um, on my Facebook timeline that of that conversation that basically like basically laying out exactly what happened and, and how we came to this to this point. Because at first, I mean, listen, when he started doing this, he was sitting down for the national anthem while the while the anthem was being played. Nobody even knew for the first few games what he was even doing. You know what I mean? Until somebody, I think a reporter asked him and he explained it. It's kind of like the same thing with, with my what Abdul Raouf when you know when he went through that and same thing. Like he just he used to sit down for the anthem and for for weeks nobody even nobody nobody cared nobody knew you know until they asked him and once he explained what happened that's when everything exploded. Right, but at least he, guess, but at least he came to a compromise. Is what I'm saying, but go on. I, I guess maybe people are looking for a re, uh, just a rehashing of this of what this whole thing is about now, because we can get into the discussion of the right. NFL and everything and lose sight of the the actual point. So, re, you know, rehashing that, bringing it back to its foundation and letting people know, hey, this is the fight right now, and it's not it, it's not over. There's Somebody recently just got shot from my island in it was in Texas. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. That whole that whole cop that went into the wrong apartment and it still happened is ridiculous. Um, I, you know what I I, and I guess that's kind of my thing with Nike. Like Nike's one of Nike's um, main objectives is is supporting athletes in controversial times because, you know, looking at their history, they they have a history in trafficking and rebellion, and kind of staying patient with that athlete when things are. I guess, quote unquote, getting bad. 
and being able to spin a profit again with those same athletes when it when when the you know everything clears. Um, they weren't afraid to go left sometimes when everyone else is going right. It ju- and just in terms of the I guess the optics, and they're they're one of the first. They're one of the first and largest corporations to to have a black person represent them as their face of their company, you know, be it Michael Jordan for basically their whole company, more or less, especially the beginning stages. And and um, and like you look at somebody like Tiger Woods, you had a black man representing golf for their for their sport. They even they even have golf products at the time, you know, and, you know, you look at that stuff. But so it's like. Like seeing this, Bo Jackson and Bo, Bo Jackson and Ken Griffey Jr. Right, but but what I'm saying is that like it's not surprising. I wasn't stunned by seeing them do this. You know what I mean? Just because like you've seen them kind of do this before. Maybe not to this this scale because of the topic being so serious. But you've seen them, you know, kind of take a kind of stand. Like even with the whole thing with Serena recently when the French Open um, banned her from being able to wear a cat suit. Those bastards. Um, <laughs> but, 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 uh, but, you know, but, but, uh, but honestly, that, but, but it's like, you know, you look at that situation and they kind of stepped in and made their little message, you know, they're not afraid to kind of take that direction, which is what, like, again, which is not, I'm not surprised by what they did, but it's like, I can't help but shake that feeling that them being involved, it's, it's kind of sort of takes away from the message a little bit so i don't want to take that you know i i kind of want to see where this goes so for me i'm not in the outrage i'm I'm in that wait and see mode where i kind of want to see what's okay what's happening next we understand that colin kaepernick is going to get his own line of shoes he's going to get his own line of apparel you know with regards to what he's doing but what's what is that gonna what does that mean like what is that other than selling shoes what does that mean going forward so i guess my question is what like by Nike stepping in, does it slow down or even cheapen the movement in your eyes? Wow, that's very poignant. That I'm, I'm leaving that in. <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess I guess the topic's too real, eh? Uh, <laughs> Red, that's closing for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I'll start with you, John. Like, do you feel like in some ways it kind of slows down or cheapens the movement in your eyes by any chance, or no? Uh, Calvin, always with the questions, right? No, it's like uh, I think we have to put this in context of what is going on right now, and what's going on right now is, for at least for a couple of years now, factions of the states for some reason are have declared like a subtle war on the black community and and people of color. With the whole rise of Trump and, and it's almost a resurgence of this nationalistic uh, white supremacist voice. So if you understand in that context that we're in the war, it's, it's a war that's happening. Psychological war, economic war. Um, they're coming at people on all fronts. This is a slick move because it has the potential of diluting, like Kevin was saying, the, the real conversation and taking the focus off that. And um, I don't know if it can cheapen the movement, but it can definitely sidetrack it, commodify it, distill it down into some some slogan and make the millennials feel like, yeah, we're doing something because I bought a Colin Kaepernick shoe. You know what I mean? Like I'm supporting the movement. Really, you're just getting Nike rich. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 it can definitely... In a sense, we can uh, just weaken the the narrative and sidetrack it if we're not careful, if we're not vigilant in letting people know what this really is about. And I feel we're in a we have an opportunity right now because black people are really seeing who really has the power. I think for a long time we were looking at ourselves like we were powerless and forgetting that. We are the NFL. We are, you know, baseball. You know, we are the NBA. You know, we're like the battery to um, what's cool, to fashion, to hip hop, to what's influencing the world. Right. But we're not. We're not being compensated. We're not being respected. And we're not being treated the way we deserve. So 
I feel the larger conversation to me is about us taking our power back. And we have to control our own narrative. We have to control our movement and hold people to standards and understand that we are the power. We're the battery here. And I, I feel like what Kaepernick did was powerful because the NFL wants to wants to put that narrative out that they have the power over these guys. But really, you know, these guys run the NFL. I mean, without black people in the NFL, the NFL, I wouldn't, I would never watch the NFL. So. To me, it's about just us taking our power back, any corporation or or really anybody outside of our community to change the narrative or commodify. We have to we have to stir it and we have to hold people to certain standards and account and we gotta be accountable too to each other. Interesting question. I think at this point and as from the on from the beginning of that commercial, of that campaign. You, we should all be realistic to realize. We, we should all realize the recipe has been changed altogether. It is completely different now. For right now, I can tell that the message has been diluted and it will continue to be diluted. There are a lot of movements, there are a lot of campaigns that have started out with the best of intentions, but there's not enough organization and then things end up falling by the wayside. You can say the Occupy movement was one of them. You can say the Me Too movement was another one. Colin Kaepernick's movement, you said the last time he spoke, was two years ago. Do we have the attention span to remember what he said two years ago? No. They put the man in a jacket, they they, they combed out his afro, and they walked him down the street and they gave him a strip <laughs> of rest. There is nothing to do with what he, quote-unquote, sacrificed for. And at the end of the day, if you think that this but putting Colin Kaepernick as the face of a campaign is going to help black people and uplift the movement, then you're thinking that paying $400 for a pair of Jordans is going to help black people too. It doesn't. There are only a chosen few that get to reap the benefits of the money that's being spent. Nike knows this. They know the black that how heavy they how heavy stunts they are in black culture. They know how much we gravitate and we're, we're we're drawn to nike for some reason because they quote unquote invested in some of our prized athletes but their give backs to our community are not necessarily the best let's just say right. it took chuck d it took chuck, chuck d to call out nike and shut him down original version or the pete rock remix yes <laughs> to say i like nike but wait a minute the neighborhood supports and put the money in it right remember that verse mm -hmm. yep and, and that forced Nike to run to the board quick, have a 12 o'clock meeting, and Nike play. Remember that? Participate in the lives of America's youth? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. How many years ago was that? 20? 30? <laughs> okay. And what do we know about that, that, that? What do we know about that now? Google it. See if it's still up and running. They might give a couple athletes some shoes, but are they really stopping to help anybody? What yeah. was Nike stock at before they started this campaign? What is their bottom line? Think about it. Let's not, you know, let, let's not think that George Foreman really cares about food as much as he cares about selling grills. Let's not think that Michael Jordan cares. Well, we know. Let's not think that. Let's not think that Michael Jordan cares much about like helping out these kids as much as he just cares about getting five hundred dollars out from that household to buy his shoes. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. The bottom line is his sacrifice is basically his message to become a vessel for a corporate entity. So do you guys buy the theory of not the theory, but like, but I look at, I'm looking, I guess I'm looking at it from both sides. So I, I see it in a sense where um, it's, it's tough because, you know, it's, it's something I read from Jamel Hill the other day um, and I'm not going to quote it verbatim, but like, Basically, the message she's saying is that you don't basically have to be broke in order to be woke, right? Like, no, there's no, there's nothing in the manual that says you have to basically sacrifice financially to the degree in term, terms of walking this path. It's tough because the fact that he doesn't have a career, there's only so much money he can fund in terms of his own, in terms of the things that he's looking to do. And like, and like I said, I, 
I, I I'm pretty sure you don't follow him on like social media, but I I know the the work that this guy's doing just from just from watching, just from following in, in action what he's doing. In terms of him saying anything, really all it takes is a couple of posts. Because at this stage right now, um, anything the the any word that he speaks is going to be gold. At least that first that first interview, that first conversation. It, and if I was him, I wouldn't even have a interview. I would have like a a first person narrative, you know, for about four or five minutes on on where he wants to go, what he decided to do, teaming up with Nike, and and seeing what the what the what like where's his mindset going forward now with this. Right, because like I said, he's he's brought attention to this. This this has been on the tip of everybody's tongue for the last year and a half. Um, because every time you watch NFL, you're watching you know some players kneel, some players with with, with their fists in the air, and it's you know still being talked about. So my thing is, in terms of him having to say anything, like I said again, I don't think he has to right now. But when he does, I think it should be something where he just explains it. He does because right now you don't need. You don't need Tom Sawyer, or, you know, Diane Sawyer. I mean, you don't need Diane Sawyer or, you know, or Oprah to explain your story. You, you can open up your phone, put it in selfie mode and break that down by yourself. Right. My thing is, I just want to see what the end game is here in terms of like, what's the what does this partnership mean in that sense? Right. Like, I understand everything you're saying based on history. I love the, the, the fact that you brought up Chuck D. <laughs> um, so we understand where 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 history has been laid out. I just want to see because obviously this this move is calculated, and we've talked about this offline in terms of Nike making this move with with Kaepernick. We all know that this thing wasn't just was wasn't just created overnight. So basically, like if Trump tweets about his his hate towards this, that's like a win for them. You know what I mean? Like that's that's just good business at this point. Um, I just want to see like. Okay, for example, like I expect this product line to sell out, you know, and I still think with that, because Kaepernick is going to get royalties from this, I still expect him to be giving back to the community as he has been, um, because, you know, again, that's that's his mantra right now. And, and I, I don't think that's going to change. Is Nike going to be supporting those communities with them? Like, that's the question I want to see. I want to I, I hope to, that's going to be answered one way or another. But, you know, we're going to find out soon enough, soon enough um, what's going to happen with this. You know, I'm not going to ask them for Nike to come and change policy, as you were saying, change policy, because I'm not expecting any any corporation to, to well, a sneaker company to do that. If they can, that's great. But I'm that's just not my expectation. I'm not looking for that for them to do that. Where do you see this going now with Kaepernick? Uh, I think he's out the league. Sorry. I think he's out the league. He's not coming back to the league. They're going to cite the fact that he hasn't played football in X amount of time. It's more than evident that they will gainfully employ Nathan Peterman in Buffalo to throw interceptions on a <laughs> snap-by-snap basis <laughs> rather than give Colin Kaepernick reps. John Elway couldn't be happier to say that, I offered him a job, and he didn't want it, so we moved on. Right? right. The man is out the league. Nike gets to control his message. He becomes, he's basically like almost like a slave to a record label. I don't know how long this contract is that he's into, but whatever it is, he has not issued any statements in regards to social justice or anything along those lines. He is going to get royalties. People are going to be skewed on, on the message, which is fine. Millennials may or may not do their research. And we will... If nobody else picks up the flame or picks up the baton, the movement the movement will fall by the wayside. Because something happened this week and who's standing up for like who's 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 making a call to arms? How come he hasn't addressed it? Stand up, believe in believe in something, if, even if it means sacrificing everything. Why didn't he take a stand in the past seven days? That shooting of the man of the black man in his in, in was it an apartment or hotel room? What was it? Apartment. His apartment. His okay. Apartment. The sh- yeah, the shooting in the apartment. How come Colin Kaepernick or Nike have yet to issue a statement in regards to what happened? But are you expecting Nike to step in and say that anytime somebody like? Because I'm not. Well, can, Personally, I'm not. Well, well, I, I never. Well, was. can they allow, can can they allow Colin Kaepernick to do something? Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. 
shouldn't he be the champion for his own message that Nike helped put his, his face on? Really? Are, are we that blind? Are we that numb of a society that we're just going to, like, are we that forgetful? Come on. This, shit, this, this just happened. No one said anything. Right. Okay. Nike and Phil Knight don't have to say anything. But Colin Kaepernick, seven days prior, less than seven days, the ink isn't even dry yet. Something else happens. He's mute. But merch is coming out. So let's line up the Foot Locker. Let's get our paychecks ready and support Cap. <laughs> and where do you see this going with Kaepernick, John? I wonder what he is really able to say and not able to say. It would be, so best case, or a good case in there would be for him to be able to turn up the volume and speak from his heart and not being, you know, not, not really being afraid to say what he wants to say or lose his endorsement to Nike. That would be interesting to see. That would, that would like, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Right. For an athlete or an entertainer to uh, almost be almost as reckless as Donald Trump, but it, just really speaking from your heart and still getting paid and still having an endorsement. I, I kind of would like to see that. It's unprecedented. I think because I think that would break the mold. Yeah. Um, it's unprecedented. I don't think we've yeah, seen it before. It, we well, yeah, it, you, you haven't seen it. I think if I was Kaepernick, you know, I would, I would hold Nike feet to the fire. I'm like, okay, you're using me. I'm going to use you. Right. The issue is when you're dancing with the devil, when you're doing a, a deal with them, you know that you're, you know, you're being used, right? You're you're being used by a corporate machine. So what can you do with that? What leverage can you gain from from that agreement with them? Um, he put himself out to be a sacrificial lamb, so I think he might have to go all the way with it and not hold back any punches and say what he needs to say about America, about the state of sports I think he really has an opportunity to shake things up mm -hmm. to be like this is crazy what's happening how they could just uh, ship you out of the damn game for saying what you want to say and the shit is still happening in our country and nobody gives a shit it's, let's back to Monday Night Football again and all these guys come out of these same communities where they've been harassed by, by, by cops so I think he has a he's in a position where look, I want to see it play out. Um, and I do think it would be nice to see the community hold his feet to the fire, too. Yeah. And say, bro, you're going to make us buy a hundred and something dollar sneaker. Really, like, you put yourself out there to kind of speak on our, our behalf. And we, want to, we want to see you do that. Like, we want to see you speak from your heart. We want to see you really take it to the limit now. So that, that would be interesting to see in terms of the movement itself i don't know it's 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 uh it's it's at a weird place but i will say what i'm seeing in, in, in these social media circles i'm really impressed to see that a lot of people are very savvy and they're seeing through this a lot of people are having these same discussions and there are various age groups too i'm impressed to see that from our people um and i i think Although, you know, the millennials could be deceived by it, I think we should definitely give some credit to some of these youth. I work with a lot of them, and they're very, very woke. Not in that commercial woke sense. Right. But there's an, there seems to be an awakening happening around this, like, late 20s age group. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're very fire. Even if they just, you know, had their awakening a year or two years ago, something, whatever sparked them. They're really seeing through the the BS, so I know I'm 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 hoping they can uh, take something from this and push it to the limit, even even hold his feet to the fire, if they're gonna go buy that hundred dollar friggin' sneaker. Right. So, yeah, so we're at we're at a serious time right now. We're at we're at a very important time.